Thank you very much, and welcome to the first debate of our fall series. Uh, we're excited to be back and pleased to see such a nice uh, turnout. This crowd was not terrorized by the weather. Uh, this is our 51st debate, but it's our first with Slate as our media partner, and our first for our new relationship with PBS and WNET as our television outlet. We're delighted to have such uh, first-class partners joining our effort to improve the quality of our public discourse. So to our resolution tonight, it's time to end the war on terror. Ideologically, the appeal of terrorism as a way to redress grievances has been undermined. The Arab Spring has accomplished far more through largely peaceful means than Al-Qaeda ever accomplished through violence. Tactically, the balance has shifted. Osama bin Laden was uniquely charismatic and inspirational with large financial resources. Now he's dead, as are most of his lieutenants. Al-Qaeda's leadership is fractured, its communications primitive, its financing highly constrained, and its operational capabilities severely limited. We achieved this result by expending enormous resources for intelligence, surveillance, drone attacks, and brilliantly coordinated raids. But the Al-Qaeda war was never going to be ended by a peace treaty. History, however, has moved on, and it's time for us to move on as well. The war on terror no longer makes sense as an organizing principle for US policy. Well, what's the counter argument to all of this? It is that we cannot simply declare victory and shift our concerns elsewhere. Terrorist attacks are still occurring with de depressing frequency in Iraq and in Afghanistan. Pakistan's duplicity has been exposed, but it remains a nuclear power with destabilizing radical Islamic elements. Suicide bombers are still an, a a an asymmetric threat and a tactic to be reckoned with. America is hated as much as ever by Islamic jihadists, who certainly have the desire to d inflict mass casualties on us through whatever means they can obtain. This is not the time to bask in the glow of victory, but rather the time to maintain the vigilance that has kept us safe during the decade we are about to mark this week. But which is the better argument? It's up to you to decide, and to help you make that decision, we've assembled an extraordinary panel of experts. Before I turn the evening over to them and to our moderator, John Donvan, I'd like to invite Jacob Weisberg, editor-in-chief of the Slate Group, to say a word. Bob, thank you. Um, we at Slate couldn't be more excited about uh, becoming Intelligence Squared's media partner um, you know, from our start, which is 15 years ago, Slate's been all about the value of debate and conversation, the dialogue that the web allows you to have instead of what you might think of as the monologue in print. And uh, I've seen that same approach embodied in the Intelligence Squared debates, both as a participant, which to my relief I'm not tonight, and uh, as a member of the audience. Uh, like Slate, Intelligence Squared, is committed to the view that serious argument can be entertaining and that ideas and policy can be on fun. Uh, on our site, we're hoping to extend these conversations in both directions. We're going to run pieces, articles, to help frame the subjects in advance, and we want to continue the conversation after the event is over. Uh, this isn't the only debate we'll be covering tonight, but we have a reporter here tonight uh, in case you want to read tomorrow and read uh, a, a journalist's take on, on what took place. I should say we've had a terrific time already working with Bob, with Dana Wolf, and the, their amazing team uh, to help, help craft the propositions for the fall season. And we hope we've got a roster of ones that will prove both urgent and engaging. So the subject we're starting out with tonight, which Bob framed extremely well, couldn't be more vital in its importance uh, to the city of New York, to the country, and to the world. So I don't want to delay it any further. I will uh, turn it over to get things underway. It's my privilege to give you John Donvan. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. And, and Jacob, you, you were a very good debater, by the way. 
So I, I'd just like to invite one more round of applause for Robert Rosencrantz and Jacob Weisberg. <laughs> True or false, it is time to end the war on terror. That's what we are here to debate. This is another verbal matchup from Intelligence Squared US. I'm John Donvan of ABC News. We're at the Skirball Center for the Performing Arts at New York University and on hundreds of NPR stations across the nation. It's time to end the war on terror. Two teams will be arguing that proposition from opposite sides for it and against it. And all of our debaters come at this topic from first-hand experience. They include security expert Peter Bergen, who as a journalist interviewed Osama bin Laden in 1997 and sent out some of the earliest warning signals. Ladies and gentlemen, Peter Bergen. Uh, Peter, um, we're doing a preliminary introduction and then, you know what, you know what, Peter did exactly what we asked him to do, but we forgot to tell him it was going to happen twice, and that's our fault, my apologies. His debating partner, Juliet Kayam, who in the Obama administration was an assistant secretary for Homeland Security. Opposing them at the facing table, Mike Hayden, who ran the CIA and before that the National Security Agency. And Richard Falkenrath, who advised President Bush on Homeland Security, then moved to New York City to become Deputy Commissioner of Counterterrorism. So all four of these people know what they are talking about, and yet they disagree on calling an end to the war on terror. All of them are dedicated to winning you over to their point of view here in our live audience, because you, our live audience, are the judges in this debate, and that's what this is. It is a contest. There will be winners and losers, and in this contest, you will decide who wins. We're going to ask you, by the time the debate has been concluded, to vote twice, once before and once again afterwards, and the team that has changed its numbers the most, changed most of your minds, will be named our winner. So let's go first and have to the preliminary vote. You each have keypads at your seats. Our motion is this. It's time to end the war on terror. If you agree with this proposition, push number one. If you disagree, push number two. And if you're undecided, push number three. And if you feel that you've made an error in the process, just correct it and the system will lock in your most recent vote. It looks like everybody's done. So to remind you again, that vote will be tabulated immediately, but we'll hold the result to the end of the debate to tell you what that base number is. And then we'll have you vote once again at the end of the evening and the team that has changed the most minds will be declared our winner. So on to the debate, round one, opening statements from each debater in turn. Our motion is this, it's time to end the war on terror. And speaking first for the motion, I'd like to introduce Peter Bergen, a CNN national security analyst. He's director of national security studies at the New America Foundation and a best-selling author. In 1997, he traveled to Afghanistan and conducted Osama bin Laden's first television interview. And Peter, I just want to share with you the fact that even your opponents concede that your knowledge of the operational details of terrorist groups is encyclopedic. I don't know if that's a psych out <laughs> or, or not, but I hope you can take it as a compliment. I, I do, thank okay, you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, Peter Bergen. Thank you. <clears throat> First of all, um, Juliet and I wanted to acknowledge the three and a half decades of public service that General Hayden has done, and also Richard Falkenraff's more than a decade of public service. And I also wanted to acknowledge Juliet Kayyem's de a decade and a half of public service, where she became the highest ranking Arab American in the Obama administration, Assistant Secretary at the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, she also had three kids, kids that she raised at the same time, putting um, home into Homeland Security in a meaningful <laughs> sense, and is one of the world's leading experts on the question of Homeland Security. My own connection to this story came um, when the Trade Center was bombed for the first time in 93. I traveled to Afghanistan, produced a documentary about the threat we faced from Afghanistan, and then, of course, interviewed bin Laden. I've written three books on the subject of al-Qaeda. I've embedded with our troops on multiple occasions in Iraq and Afghanistan. <clears throat> From a self-interested point of view, I have every incentive to say the threat that al-Qaeda and, uh, and uh, you know, the terrorism uh, poses to us remains very serious. And it merits an open-ended conflict against them. But in good conscience, I simply can't make that argument. War is no longer the most appropriate way to look at the uh, problems we face today. 
Our singular focus on terrorism also masks many more pressing problems. Our crumbling infrastructure, decaying schools, deeply serious economic problems, and other national security problems, managing the future of the Arab Spring, for instance, preventing nuclear war between Pakistan and India, preventing a nuclear war between North Korea and South Korea, managing the rise of China, which, while we've been uh, sort of distracted by the war on terror, has uh, quietly expanded its influence in Africa um, and in Southeast Asia. Our opponents want to prolong the war on terror, an open-ended conflict against a tactic that is already America's longest war. We're saying it's time for the war to end. President Obama correctly redefined this conflict downwards from a global open-ended conflict against a tactic to the more precise formulation of a war against Al-Qaeda and its allies, which both names the enemy and narrows the, the focus of the conflict. When we say we want the war on terror, it's time for it, the war on terror to end, we don't mean we should precipitously pull out of Afghanistan, but we do mean that it's time to stop conceiving of our principal national security goal as the defeat of terrorists when putting, for instance, our own economic house in order will do far more to prepare us for the next real war we will inevitably be faced at some point in the future. The war on terror, as everybody in the audience knows, has cost the American public at least a trillion dollars in expenditure in wars around the world and, of course, got us into the catastrophic Iraq war. Further trillions on our, both our intelligence and homeland national security apparatus resulted in policies such as coercive interrogations and extraordinary renditions. And you'll hear from my partner that the government has response has for years anyway moved away from the war on terror and what it entails, not because there is no threat, we're not claiming that at all, but because the threat has changed and has adapted and so we, must we as well. Key American national, national security officials now say that Al Qaeda is on its last legs. John Brennan, who of course is President Obama's chief counterterrorism advisor said that just last week. Leon Panetta said that the uh, strategic defeat of Al-Qaeda is within sight. General David Petraeus has said the same sort of, uh, made the same sort of comments recently. None of these gentlemen can be considered as to be defeatist or sharp, soft on terrorism. So is this premature tri triumphalism the claim that Al-Qaeda is on its last legs? Well, I think the claim is, is, is well justified. I mean, the leadership of Al-Qaeda has been completely decimated in a campaign of drone attacks. The most dangerous job in the world right now has been Al-Qaeda's number two. There have been about 20 of them since... Uh, uh, 2008, including most recently the group's number two, Atiyah Rachman, who was killed just a few week, uh, just a, about a week ago. Al Qaeda hasn't carried out a successful attack in the West since the 7/7 attacks in London six years ago. Al Qaeda hasn't killed a single American in the United States as, uh, since 9/11. And think about the real wars we've really confronted. Uh, the Civil War threatened to tear this country apart. World War II, we defeated an enemy that instigated a global conflict that killed tens of millions. And if the Cold War had ended with a bang instead of a whimper, we'd all be not at this debate because we'd all be dead. Those are serious threats. Uh, the war on terror, the, the threat we face from Al-Qaeda, uh, doesn't come close. And in fact, only 17 Americans have died as a result of Al-Qaeda's ideological ideas in this country. Uh, 13 of them, of them, of course, at Fort Hood and others in other places. More Americans accidentally die in their own bathtubs every year by considerable numbers, around 300, and we don't have an unreasonable fear of bathtubs, so we shouldn't have an unreasonable fear of Al-Qaeda. And, and, but terrorism wins if we're terrified, by the way, of course, and, and we be, we're doing the job of the terrorists for them if we, are, we live in this state of constant fear that our opponents wish us to live in. And the, everybody in the audience knows very well that the threat from terrorism has actually dramatically receded in the years since the 9-11 attacks. And that's in part because Al-Qaeda and bin Laden have been losing the war of ideas in the Muslim world for years. Their founder and leader was uh, uh, killed, as you know, in Abdabad on May, um, the evening of May 1st. In the Arab Spring, there's not a single revolutionary is carrying a single picture of Osama bin Laden. Bin Laden's ideas have been completely absent from the Arab Spring. Uh, there hasn't been a single flag burning in the Arab Spring of an American flag or even an Israeli flag. So bin Laden's foot soldiers' ideas um, and, and leadership is simply absent from this enormously important phenomenon in the Arab world. Our, our opponents may claim that we are still threatened by terrorists armed with weapons of mass destruction. This claim, of course, got us into the disastrous war in Iraq. And in fact, of the 188 jihadi terrorist cases in this country uh, since 9-11, not a single one of them involved chemical, biological, radiological, or nuclear weapons. We will no doubt hear from our opponents that to argue the war on terror is, is, is over as soft or unrealistic or weak. And they may claim that, that at some point we will decide we're no longer, we no longer need to define it as a war on terror, but we aren't there yet. I would submit to you in the audience, uh, if the death of the founder and leader of Al-Qaeda 
isn't the point where we can't say the war on terror is over. And then add to that the destruction of almost of its entire top leadership, its absence in the revolutions across the Middle East, its inability to mount any kind of attack on the United States for a decade, isn't the point to end the war on terror. When will that point be? We say it's now. Thank you, Peter Bergen. Our top position is it's time to end the war on terror. And here to speak against this motion, Michael Hayden, an Air Force four-star general. He's former director of the National Security Agency and the Central Intelligence Agency. He has overseen virtually every branch of the intelligence community. He is now a principal at the Chertoff Group as his debating partner, Richard Falkenrath. And I, I understand, uh, Mike, you have a, a great deal of Pittsburgh in you. I, I and, do. <laughs> and, and that Pittsburgh uh, returned the affection by naming a highway, stretch of highway after you. Actually, it's a street right next to Heinz Field, and the first question I asked was, can I park there during football games? <laughs> I, how do you work that out? Do you just drive up and down your street all the time, <laughs> looking at the sun? Take the grandkids, look, look, look up there. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Michael Hayden. Thank you. <clears throat> Well, good evening, and thanks for the opportunity to talk about such an important topic. And then it is, really is an important topic. It's not something that we should just decide idly. It's not something we should decide because we're merely in a celebratory mood. Uh, when, I, when, when I talk to audiences uh, about the war on terror, uh, I generally refer to a, a, a speech I gave uh, at the German embassy in the spring of 2007. Uh, the Germans were in the chair of the European Union, and the German ambassador would have the ambassadors to the United States from the European Union over for lunch about every two weeks and would have an American come in to kind of be the lunchtime entertainment and it was my turn. Uh, I decided that the German ambassador was a good friend, they deserved a good speech, and I decided I would talk to the European Union delegates about renditions, detentions, and interrogations that were being conducted by the CIA at that time. About page two or three of that speech, I wanted to make very clear to my audience what I thought, what my agency thought, and what I think my nation thought. And I gave them four sentences. We believe we are a nation at war. We are at war with Al Qaeda and its affiliates. The, the description that, that Peter just gave and that President Obama emphasized, but reflected what we were thinking several years earlier. A nation at war, at war with Al Qaeda and its affiliates, this war is global in scope, and we can only fulfill our moral and ethical responsibilities to you, the citizens of, the, of this republic, by taking this fight to this enemy wherever he may be. George Tenet was the uh, DCI, the Director of Central Intelligence. In 1999, sent a note out to all of us in the intelligence community saying, we're at war with Al Qaeda. And George was, but America wasn't. America went to war with Al Qaeda shortly after the attacks on September 11, 2001. Two successive American presidents have defined us as being at war with Al Qaeda. The American Congress has defined us as being, as being at war with Al Qaeda. And the American court system, only a few blocks from here, has defined us as being at war with Al Qaeda when a defendant attempting to claim he had been denied his right to a speedy trial because he had been in detention for several years. His claim was rejected by the court, saying that we, as a nation at war, had a right to detain him as a combatant. Now, we could discuss troop levels in Iraq, the rate of withdrawal from Afghanistan, a whole bunch of other details about this war. But that's not the point I think Rich and I want to make. The point we want to make is the legal construct, the legal belief that we are a nation at war, that we are a nation in conflict, and we have a right because we are in that status, to use the legal tools and the legal authorities that a nation at war is allowed to use. What it is we're supporting is to keep all available tools on the table, to keep a menu of options from law enforcement, diplomacy, or to arm conflict in order to keep you safe. I would also add, and I really want to emphasize this, okay, that conceiving yourself at war, in addition to whatever it is you might do in a law enforcement channel, is not somehow lawless. It is perfectly lawful. It is a different lawful approach than a law enforcement approach, but it is consistent with the laws of armed conflict that we have a right to resort to in order to defend ourselves. I assume everyone here 
is happy that Osama bin Laden was killed on the morning of the 2nd of May in Pakistan. Let me give you, thank, okay, thank you. Now, let me give you a slightly different description of that event. A heavily armed agent of the United States government was in a room with an unarmed man who was under indictment in the United States judicial system and who was offering no significant resistance to the heavily armed agent of the United States government. And that heavily armed agent of the United States government killed him. If you do not think we are at war, there are some very troubling definitions that you might want to attach to that act. That's the kind of authority we have, perfectly lawful. And in no way am I suggesting anyone acted inappropriately. We acted perfectly lawfully because we are a nation at war and generally recognized as such. You don't want to take those tools off the table while there are terrorists out there. If you let this tool go, you will be less safe. Okay. If you look at the scope of our constitutional system, the law enforcement approach is designed, if you look at the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and American statutory law, the law enforcement approach is designed to make the government weak because we don't want the government arbitrarily taking away your liberties. On the other hand, if you look at those sections of the Constitution that deal with armed conflict, they are designed to make the government strong so that it can protect you. You don't want to take that tool off the table. And, and, and quite perversely, if you take that tool off the table, you may actually threaten your own civil liberties. Bear with me. There's a tight connection here. If the options of a nation at war are taken away from your toolkit, you must then rely on the options offered by law enforcement. If you recall the events in, on Christmas Day a year or two ago, Detroit, uh, Omar Farouk Abdul Talib, the underwear bomber, and he was Mirandized after about 50 minutes of interrogation. And I think everyone, everyone recognized that was probably a mistake. We should have interrogated him farther. We had the Attorney General talking to the American Congress about legislation that would make Miranda more malleable so that we could interrogate these kinds of people longer in our law enforcement approach. I don't want to make Miranda more malleable. Miranda defends me, defends you, defends your rights. And we're forced to contort the law enforcement approach when we attempt to make it answer and deal with questions it was never designed to deal with. This is one of those questions. Don't take that other tool, we are a nation at war, off the table. Thank you. Thank you, Michael Hayden. Our motion is, it's time to end the war on terror. We are now halfway through opening remarks of this Intelligence Squared U.S. debate. I'm John Donvan of ABC News. We have four debaters, two teams of two, fighting it out over our motion, our proposition, it's time to end the war on terror. You have heard two of the opening statements, and now on to the third. I want to introduce Julia, Juliette Kayim, who, um, as I said at the beginning of the debate, uh, these people on the stage really have had their hands in the business that they're talking about. So. Her resume includes um, a stint at the Justice Department, former Assistant Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security, the National Security and Foreign Policy columnist for the Boston Globe. You've also served as uh, Chief of Homeland Security in the state of Massachusetts. You're a faculty member at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. A mother of three, we've heard earlier, and often described as the Obama administration's highest ranking senior Arab American female official. Wow. So wow. which of those tells you how many which of those are. which of those items is the most relevant? American. American. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Juliet um, Kayam. So I want to thank Bob and Dana, Peter, Mike, and Rich, um, and the organizers of Intelligence Squared. Um, and I also want to take a moment to acknowledge, obviously, tonight, 10 years later, and the tragedy and burdens uh, this city has suffered. We will debate with passion here, but with the full acknowledgement that many of you suffered tremendously. The proposition I am arguing for tonight is the war on terror is over. That can mean a lot of things, obviously. For me, it means one thing. A certain mindset came to be known as the war on terror, and that mindset, thankfully, is over. To explain what I mean, I want to tell you a story. 
I did re-enter government in 2006 when, when Governor Deval Patrick um, became governor of Massachusetts, and one of my duties was to oversee the Massachusetts National Guard. I inherited a program that had been established on September 12th, which was to put National Guard members um, on the roadways uh, leading up to our only nuclear facility, Pilgrim facility. And it was understandable in those days. You wanted to show greater force protection. More than five years later, they were still there, the National Guard members, uh, despite the tremendous work being done to counter the terrorist threat and despite no evidence that terrorists would seek to enter by road a heavily fortified facility. Uh, nobody involved with the intricacies of that security uh, thought that they were still necessary, but no one knew, really knew how to pivot. It was, it's very hard to pivot. Uh, and the political, military, and public input had to be aligned. It took us a while, but eventually we did move on. And I tell that story uh, uh, not as evidence that the terrorist threat is over, not at all. I tell it to say that there were other procedures that we then put in place. More aggressive surveillance sharing, better surveillance of the streets, better communications uh, between the uh, nuclear facility owners and the uh, local first responders uh, that we instituted uh, instead of the 19 National Guard members rotating 24-7. I tell this story to remind you that 10 years is a long time. It is a long time to fight any war, but one particularly where the enemy has changed so dramatically. And over that time, there have been a whole range of shifts in every jurisdiction in the federal government that have been similar to the one I just described. So to just call the ongoing effort to dismantle, kill, and disrupt Al-Qaeda and its affili affiliates a con continuity or continuation of the war on terror, capital T, capital W, capital T, is to treat the United States and the government apparatus established since 9-11 as frozen in time. It assumes that there has been no learning, no growth, no perspectives achieved, no recognition of mistakes made, no priority shifts, no advancements in our abilities and capabilities. It is assumed that time has stood still for us. In many respects, this, year, this debate actually is a few years too late. The war on terror, as it became known, was an entire government ideology based on the notion that Islamic terrorism represented a unified and operationally centralized threat, demanding a predominantly a military response with the president as commander in chief who could use any means necessary. Nobody especially people who have served in national security, deny that there is still a terrorist threat. And the U.S. government, under any administration, to pick up on General Hayden's point, is going to have a variety of tools to use to combat that threat, that threat including military force. Nobody needs to make apologies for that, neither the left nor the right. The authorization for the use of military force passed immediately after 9-11, gave the president and future ones the legal authorization to fight al-Qaeda with force. It is still the law today, and it is still good law. But the fact that the government continues to use many of these same counterterrorism strategies, including killing bin Laden, of course, does not mean that the war on terror and all that it entailed remain, because we should go through the list. The enhanced interrogation, the dark side, the with us or against us, the indiscriminate interviewing of particular Arab and Muslim communities, the registration of Arab immigrants, military tribunals that adhere to standards unrecognized in military law, uh, the new, the color code alerts, the breathless press conferences, the rejection of the law of wars, the treating of the Geneva Conventions as quaint, secret wiretapping in violation of established law, the disdain for the judiciary. Those were also part of that war. And thankfully, they are over, and they, they began to be over during the Bush administration and a continuation in this administration. It has not been more of the same, and that is good, because we got better. Over these 10 years during both Bush and Obama administration, the US security apparatus became more focused and sophisticated. It was because the threat had changed, it became, was more decentralized and disparate, and we have adapted to that, certainly, by using military tactics to kill Al-Qaeda affiliates worldwide, but we have also become more focused, measuring success by effectiveness over sheer activity. And nowhere is this more true than in Homeland Security. Unlike war, Homeland Security is very bottom-up. It begins with locals who run police departments or emergency management divisions or, or public health facilities. It is overseen by mayors and governors, and if you want to talk about a change in America, there's only one governor who was governor on 9-11 still in a state house, and he's debating in California right now because he doesn't want to be governor anymore. That's Rick Perry. 
Um, so, I mean, there's just been tremendous change, right, over these 10 years. And so calling it a war on terror for them does not help them manage budgets or defend certain programs or know actually how to prioritize. As Rich, who, uh, Falkenrath, who helped institutionalize the phrase dual use, policies that help the cop on the street in finding crime, as well as in counterterrorism, that provide training for emergency managers for a tower falling, as well as Hurricane Irene, these are the most sustainable and effective. The color code systems seemed appropriate in an era that created a, a warlike climate, but provided no clarity to the first responders on how to, how, to, how to react. And the public rightfully rejected it. More localized efforts to engage immigrant communities or in nationally adopting the See Something, Say Something campaign that came out of New York City are good and effective government action. And they are necessary, as we have reason to be concerned with radicalization in our own nation. None of these require military engagement or mindset, although, of course, as I've said, there might be a need for military engagement and it's authorized by law. These are smart strategies adopted by people across the ideological spectrum. I am here not because I have some invested intellectual interest in saying the war is over, military efforts will need to be utilized, that goes without saying. But do not forget what the war on terror was and do not forget how much progress we have made in moving past it. What has replaced it is a different way of thinking about the threat and our response. Surely not everything is perfect, but criticism is accepted. There is nothing soft or weak or liberal about believing the war on terror is over. It is actually the way the world is. And ask yourself, are we less safe now now, uh, from having moved on. Thank you. Thank you, Julia Kayyem. Our motion is, it's time to end the war on terror. And here to speak forth and against the motion, Richard Falkenrath, who has served as Deputy Commissioner for Counterterrorism of the New York City Police Department, and as Deputy Homeland Security Advisor to President Bush during the Bush administration, obviously. And uh, Richard, um, I, I don't know if you know this. Uh, coincidentally, we lived on the same street in Washington during that period, and all of the neighbors had a habit of watching your face <laughs> as you would come home from work every day to try to figure out if we were in trouble or not. And I, I just wanted to congratulate you on your poker face. Oh, thanks. Because <laughs> thanks, we John. never knew. Ladies and gentlemen, Richard Falcon. <laughs> that was a, a scary time, and happily it's over. Now, forgive my voice, I've got a little bit of a cold. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you to the organizers, uh, the sponsors, to the other panelists, all of whom are long and close friends. Uh, we've known each other for a, a long time. Um, debates like this often turn on trying to convince the audience, the voters, of a definition. And if you get them thinking about a proposition defined your way, it's clear which side should prevail. And if you get them thinking about a proposition defined the other way, it's clear which side should prevail. And, uh, and this is no uh, exception to that rule. The war on terror is a very open-ended concept, and it can be construed in many different ways. And Peter and Juliet uh, construe it in a way that really isn't that surprising, uh, but they were very candid about, frankly, which is they'd like it to be defined as a certain mindset that we experienced at some point in the past that we no longer should have today. And I find, uh, I, if I would probably, if I was on their side of the proposition, I'd argue it the same way, because this is a tough one uh, to argue if you argue it the way Mike and I think it should be argued, which, in fact, Juliet agrees with, which is you need to make this an operational proposition. You need to define it in some very precise way so there's something really to weigh in on. It's not just some squishy mindset and set of feelings. It's actually something practical. And here, in fact, it is something practical. War on terror, war is a, is a legal state, as Mike said. It's, it exists in law. Um, it is uh, decreed by Congress, and in fact, they did decree it in this case with the authorization for the use of military force. Passed by Congress on September 14th, signed by President Bush on September 18th, and still in force today. And the way I understand this proposition this, that we're voting on here is essentially, do, should we uh, repeal or modify this in some way or another. And uh, Mike and I say, no, we shouldn't. This should still stand. Uh, Juliet also agrees with us. She thinks this should stand too. I'm not sure where Peter is. But it's worth noting exactly what it says, because this is what it means to be in a war on terror. It means to have this as your law of the land. It says that the president is authorized to use all, to use all necessary and appropriate force against those nations, organizations, or persons he determines, determines 
planned, authorized, committed, or aided the terrorist attacks that occurred on September 11th, or harbored such organizations or persons in order to prevent any further acts of international terrorism against the United States by such nations, organizations, or persons. Now, our position is quite simple, is that this should stay the law of the land. This should be the law in the United States. Because if it's not, then something Peter said is no longer the case. Having the number two job in Al-Qaeda is no longer the most dangerous job in the world. It is today, and he's still there. The number two in Al-Qaeda, yes, they're much, much diminished. Decimated probably isn't too strong a word for Al-Qaeda. But the number two officer in Al-Qaeda on 9-11, Ayman Zawahiri, a shadow of the man bin Laden was, he's still alive. He's in Pakistan. But for this provision of law, we can't use military force unilaterally against him. This is what makes such action lawful. And without this, the alternative is to go arrest him, Mirandize him, bring him back to the court, which is an option, which frankly I don't believe should be taken off the table either, probably not what we will end up pursuing in his case. But it simply makes no sense. It makes no sense to say you should repeal this. So that's my sort of first big point to you, is this is the law of the land. The war on terror is a legal state that gives us opportunities to do things under the code of law, not extra-legally, so that if that commando team does go in and kill someone, it's not murder. It is, in fact, an act of war blessed by both branches of government, the judiciary, the, the executive, and the legislative. And without this, illegal. So we don't want that. And this strikes me as clearly sensible to continue. Now, should it continue indefinitely? Who knows? I'm not prepared to say exactly when it should stop. But right now, today, when we know some of the perpetrators of 9-11 are still at liberty, presumably in Pakistan, it really makes no sense whatsoever to repeal this. Now, Juliet and, and Peter would have us think instead about the proposition a different way and say it's about a mindset. It's about that terrible state that John referred to when neighbors would look at a senior White House official's face to see how it was when he came home from work. Those days are happily over, and hopefully they'll never uh, come back. That's really not the proposition here. Yes, there were lots of things. There were, we want to have a, another proposition, which was, you know, did President Bush overdo it in the first four years after 9-11? That's a whole different debate, and maybe we, that they would prevail, prevail on that one. We're debating a different proposition here. This is not about whether we think President Bush got it just right in the first couple of years after 9-11 or not. This is also not really a partisan issue. And yeah, I worked for Bush, but I also worked for Mike Bloomberg. He, who knows what he is? I mean, he was a, uh, now he's independent, then he was a Republican, at one point he was a Democrat. This is not really a partisan thing. But Peter made an interesting point. He said President Obama has more correctly and more precisely characterized the continued offensive action against Al Qaeda and its affiliates. And, and he's absolutely right that the President, President Obama's rhetoric is very different from President Bush's. They talk about it very differently. But the practice, the nitty gritty of what happens in counterterrorism internationally, operationally, from the last four years of the Bush administration to today in 9-11, not only is it fundamentally unchanged, Obama is tougher, he's harsher, he's sharper. And I'll give you just one example. Oh, uh, I understand, Mike probably knows this, I just hear it from the news, there is a list of individuals who may be targeted by name individually for lethal airstrikes. Under, that list started under Bush. I think it's notified to Congress. Under Bush, that list consisted only of non-US persons, so foreigners. If we are to believe what we read in the paper, President Obama has added a US citizen to that list who may be targeted by name. This is a former, this is an extremely liberal, former constitutional law professor who has added a US citizen to a list of people who may be targeted by name. Now he does it because of this aspect of law, which consists today, that individual, Anwar Alaki, is in Yemen, he is a US citizen. He is vulnerable to lethal strike today that are lawful under US law. I submit today it makes no sense to repeal that law at this time and thus under the terms of this debate and the war on terror. Thank you. Thank you, Richard Dawson. And that concludes round one of this Intelligence Squared U.S. debate where the motion being argued is it is time to end the war on terror.
Keep in mind how you voted at the top of the evening. We're going to ask you to vote again at the end of the debate and reminding you that the team that has changed the most minds will be declared our winner. Now, before we go on to round two, I want to correct a mistake I made in the pronunciation of Juliet's surname. Um, and I just want to, not, not just to be nice, I want to actually say it again as I said it at the beginning of the uh, program so that it can be edited correctly into the radio broadcast. Um, and so I'm going to say it, and then I'd love it if you clapped with as much <laughs> fervor as you did the first time. And Peter's partner, Juliette Kayam, who in the Obama administration was an assistant secretary for Homeland Security. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I apologize. I really think name pronunciation is entirely unforgivable, so you don't even have to forgive me. <laughs> okay. Um, so now on to round two, where the debaters address each other directly and answer questions from the audience and from me. We're here at the Skirball Center for the Performing Arts at New York University. We have two teams of two arguing this motion. It is time to end the war on terror. The side arguing for that proposition, Juliet Kayam and Peter Bergen, are arguing that it never made sense to call our response to September 11th the war, and that in any case, the enemy that provoked that war, Al-Qaeda, is now on its last legs. Arguing against the motion that it's too soon to end the war on terror, Michael Hayden and Richard Falconrath, their view that there are still enemies out there dedicated to hurting us and is that as long as they are there, calling it a war gives the government the tools and the powers that it needs to protect the people. So I want to ask a question to, to the side that's arguing that it's time to end the war on terror, and it's this. Do our enemies have any say in telling us whether this is a war or not? If they are there and they want to hurt us, and even if Al-Qaeda had been, had been put on the run, it was clear in the documents that were recovered from Osama bin Laden's hideout that they were still trying. And as long as they're still trying, as long as it's a war to them, can we say that it's not a war to us? Well, there's a very substantial difference between intent Peter and capability. Um, I mean, sure, there was all in, when in Bin Laden's house in Abdabad, there were all these blue sky plans to attack us on the 10th anniversary of 9-11. I think I can tell you right now that's not going to happen. These were blue sky plans. Uh, these were kind of doodlings of a guy who was basically spending five years with his three wives uh, with not much to do. Um, and uh, thinking about, you know, it was like some sort of grotesque parody of a Dr. No James Bond villain. Uh, sort of sitting there, coming up, uh, plotting mayhem. Uh, but, you know, these were not, you know, the government itself, DHS has said, you know, that, you know, that these were, there's nothing, there was nothing there there. There was no operation. He was, he was essentially somebody who history had sidelined. Uh, you know, President Obama has said something, I think, which is, I think, quite accurate. These are small men on the wrong side of history. And history just sped up for them with the Arab Spring and the death of bin Laden. And for us to sort of live in a state of constant fear that they're going to do something to us is basically to hand them a victory that they didn't even have Let's hear when Richard, he was alive. Richard so The direct answer to your question, John, is no, they don't. Whether we are at war or not is up to the United States and its constitutional authority to decide. But Peter did want something, once again, that he did in his opening remarks, which is try to get you to think that we somehow stand for the proposition that you should live in constant fear forever and it should never go away. That's absolutely not what we're saying. Nothing could be further from the truth. I work for the NYPD. Our job is not to make the people feel unsafe in their communities. You want people to feel safe. That's why you show up at work in the morning and do your job. So just let's be clear. We're at War on Terror. We have this continued legal status of a War on Terror so that everyone doesn't live in constant fear. Okay, I'm, Juliet, a, I'm a lawyer, and so let me tell you what the AUMF says. Because I agree with it, and I agree with them. I thought the question was, should the war on terror continue? So I, I didn't bring my legal books. Um, but if you want to view the war on terror as solely a legal issue, the authorization for the use of military force is because of a debate between, it's hard to imagine that they actually debated this after September 11th, is limited to Al Qaeda and its affiliates. And it gives the president authorization to use a whole bunch of tools, including military action, but a whole bunch of them, uh, to fight al-Qaeda that was responsible for 9-11 and its affiliates. That's what it does, and that is great. And we should continue to support it. But why isn't but that under war? That, but under that, but wait a second, not everything, right, was done under the agreement. First of all, this notion of a war on terror justified, and we can get into a legal argument. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I, I 
did this for a while, so I'm happy to get into a legal argument. The authorization for the use of military force was uh, limited in both in terms of uh, its target and did not initiate a war on terror. But let's not, but let's also not forget their legal analysis. Their legal analysis, if you want to talk law, was actually that because it was a war on terror, right, Congress in many ways could not limit the president's authority in a, in a number of items that we can remember, that we can all go through. So if we're going to debate law, let's debate the law as they interpret it, right? But we're not here to debate law because that's not why, you know, that, that's, Michael it's Hayden. too easy. Right. It's too easy to debate the law because actually then I'm on their side and then I shouldn't have shown up. Michael Hayden. <laughs> I, I just want to add, the, the whatever, whatever label we put on it, war on terror, war against al-Qaeda and its affiliates, the legal authority under which we operated was against al-Qaeda and its affiliates. That all we have been doing, all that we have done, has been designed against that opposing armed enemy force, al-Qaeda and its affiliates. So, so don't be confused by the labels. All along, despite whatever the rhetoric may have been, we used, again, the tools of armed conflict against a specific set of enemies authorized by the Congress of the United States. But do you, but do you hear your, your opponents saying that as a practical matter, as a, almost a cultural matter, the term war suggests much more than the issue of a legal authorization, that it does reflect a mindset and uh, taking aside keeping the population in fear and that charge, it does reflect a mindset, a commitment, um, uh, a discussion over resources, a discussion over sacrifice, that, it, that talking about a war is a great deal more than, than the, the narrow the narrow legal sense that you're talking well, about. Well, it can be, but you need an actual proposition. I mean, you need something that you actually can decide on. And when it's so subjective that you're just talking about a mindset, it's like General Hayden and I showed up in the same government for three years or so. We didn't come to work with an identical mindset. We came with slightly different mindsets. And he, at the time, was an active military officer. I think it had even different meaning to me than a civilian in the White House. So it is a very subjective thing. One of the things about this war, which is different than certainly World War II or Vietnam, is that the national security apparatus, and actually a subset of it, feels like it's at war, still to this day. But the people don't. And that's ahistoric. So it hasn't usually been that way for us. And I actually think that's OK in this particular case mm -hmm. for not everyone to feel like they're walking around mobilized for war, but for a, a subset of the national security apparatus to actually act that way. So Juliet, he's no. saying your, your definition of war is too subjective. Yeah. He's saying that, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's uh, a, a weird way to put the war on terror, only because w what followed from calling it a war on terror, which was not my language. I mean, that, that was the language of an administration that determined that after 9-11 we would conceive of it as a war, and it would have all sorts of implications, not just legal implications, but implications for a whole range of activities because we were going to call it a war. Um, and all that, so, so it wasn't just a feeling, there was a series of, of, uh, of um, procedures and policies that flowed from that. So let me just give you an example, because that may help what, that, what this legal debate means. The, the, uh, by deciding that it's a war on terror, so let's, is, this is a debate about military commissions. What do we mean by military commissions? Well, if it's a war on terror that sort of is this thing that we can define and, and and, uh, and uh, determine where we want to go with uh, uh, detainees or how we want to try or not try them, then we create a whole new military commission system that under the previous administration got, you know, essentially turned, you know, overturned by the Supreme Court. And then you have to come back, right? And then you have to say, what are we going to do with these detainees? Because it's a problem. We all agree it's a problem. And then you come back and you work with Congress and you create a Military Commission Act, which this president did, which provides this, uh, very strong protections for the people within the military commission system, um, has independent appellate review, and let's just be clear, has been supported by every Article III court, every federal court in the United States. We're not a constitutional crisis every day. You know, they, we're just not there. So, so it wasn't our language. It was the language of the AUMF. Right? It was uh, authorization for the use of military force against al-Qaeda and its affiliates. It wasn't our language. So to say now that we're calling it a feeling seems like you're sort of, you know, it's, a, it's just a little bit of amnesia there, I think. Michael Hayden. Yeah, I'm, I'm confused. Um, <laughs> are we a nation at war or not is the question I would yeah. ask. And, and do our armed forces have the right, do, does the president have the right 
to use the tools of a nation in conflict to protect you against Al-Qaeda. And we've had some commentary here about some things that were done over the last 10 years, and there's been some criticism or implied criticisms that some of these were overreactions mm -hmm. or, or not in the best traditions or novel developments in American constitutional military law. I'm, I'm not here to debate that. I am here to suggest that we are not at our best when we are fearful. And, and that to the degree that we are not fearful, we adhere to the best of our traditions. Lincoln's quote about the better angels of, of our nature. We are able to do that more freely now. We are able to consult the, those, those better angels because the threat is incredibly much reduced. And it's much reduced because those people who did those things are largely dead. And they're dead because we were a nation at war and we're allowed to use the tools of a nation at war to make them dead. I don't think it's time to give up that capacity, to give up that authority. Why, Michael, if they're mostly dead? Because P Peter mentioned, he mentioned um, <laughs> Dave, because they aren't all dead. And, and Peter mentioned John Brennan and mm -hmm. Leon Panetta and Dave Petraeus giving rather rosy descriptions of Al-Qaeda, I mean, Rosie, from our point of view. They were talking about Al-Qaeda Maine. They were talking about Al-Qaeda in Pakistan, in the tribal region. They were not talking about the franchises in Yemen, or in Somalia, or in the Islamic Maghreb. And none of them have suggested this is over. All of them, in fact, have called for at least the current tempo of operations. I have met no one who is actually responsible for creating the circumstances that make this debate possible, should we end this thing, no one who is responsible for creating that who actually thinks we ought to stop doing what we're doing. Peter Bergen. Well, I'm glad General Hayden has conceded that so many of our principal en enemies are dead. I mean, that's usually how you end a war, when your enemies are mostly dead. Um, we didn't kill every Nazi uh, to en at the end of World War II. I mean, there's a certain point what we're, what, we're not, what we're claiming here is that it's time to end the war on terror as the principal organizing principle of our national security policy, which, by the way, cost us trillions of dollars over the past decade, uh, which has allowed us to ignore a lot of serious problems we have at home and other threats abroad. Um, you know, there are a million Americans now with top secret clearances. I don't think they all needed them. Um, you know, that is a, one of the legacies of, the, of, the, of, of this, uh, defining it as a war on terror. And Richard said, you know, that we're not, he's not, we're not debating the war on terror as it was produced by uh, President George Bush in the first four years. Well, I mean, let's try and take that back for our side a little bit. We are, the war on terror was not the war on Al-Qaeda and its allies. It was an open-ended conflict against a tactic uh, that produced a lot of enormous uh, problems for this country, including the, the Iraq war and all that, the legacy we have from that. And so there is a sort of historical part to this that's important. We're not just debating uh, about what, what happened today. It's about a mindset uh, which caused this country some serious economic problems, which we are still uh, trying to recover from. So as I said, uh, these debates often turn on trying to get the voters to think about the proposition in a particular way. And uh, this Wait, proposition- But so are you doing that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's why it's called a debate. But, I've read, but I think I've read the proposition a little more closely, because you could have written it like this. It could have said, should the war on terror be the central organizing principle of U.S. foreign policy. Could have said that. Yeah, I think we would have been uncomfortable on this side of the table. But what do you, what do you think the audience is? Let me just say, do you, do you assume the audience sees it your way, or do you think the audience? Well, I've, I've suggested a way to think about it, and, as a, and to okay. try to make right. it sort of actionable. Right. Because as we've said, we are currently at war in a legal sense, and we'd like to frame this proposition saying, should we no longer be? Right. Like, that's really what it means, it's time to end the war. Term. Now, we could make this a referendum on how this was handled between September 11, 2001 and the, and the elections of 2006. Or, no. you know, you could do that too. That's a different argument. And, you know, we're prepared to have that, but it's really not the one that we face right now today. And uh, many of these issues were considered, this is ironic, by the Obama administration. Mm -hmm. Many of the, ex the sort of tactical issues. And as I said, he didn't divert anything from what Bush was doing. In fact, he intensified it. The unilateral use of military force against a neutral country, Pakistan, into their territory, didn't just stop, it, ex it, it, so, it, it so increased. So, Julian, I... Make your point, but then I want to come back uh, well, to the question. So, uh, yeah. uh, so the, I mean, a couple of things on what Rich says. This argument is actually 
if you read it, is about the war on terror. And it's not a referendum on the, la on the first four years of the Bush administration or the first six years or even the first two of Obama. It is about what did we mean by the war on terror? What was that definition that, that, you know, that, that was used for so many years? And is it ready to be, and are we ready to be over? And they are doing, they're trying to convince you sort of a simplistic notion here, which is for those of us who have also served in government and national security is, is, except, is way too simplistic. Be, simply because you want to say that the war on terror is over does not mean that you're saying uh, you know, no military action ever. Because we all know, I mean, it doesn't mean, oh gosh, I wish bin Laden had been brought to a courtroom in New York City. No one is saying that. There is authority for the president to use force, including killing bin Laden under the authorization for the use of military force. I support that. So what stops what? if you say, if you declare the war on terror over, what stops happening? Well, I think, as I said, I think it's already over. So let me, let me then, that's a great question because what also happened over the course of this 10-year period, right, is that a narrative is being rewritten. And the narrative is, is that Obama is exactly the same as Bush. But Bush wasn't exactly the same as Bush, right? We have grown. And one, you know, there are examples everywhere, coercive interrogation, the, the, the black sites, all of that we have learned. They learned, we learned, right? And that ability to change doesn't mean that, you know, oh, you know, uh, we're going to you know, continuing to call it the same thing. That war ended. That notion that military or this war on terror was how we were going to approach it became much better. And let's can we talk about homeland security but for a minute? But if it's ended, then why are you saying it's now time to end the war? Because on terror? they're never going to end it. Right. Well, I mean, to the tenth anniversary is a good time to begin to say, let's give, let have the American public say. We're ready to not think of our world this way, right? That the war John, on terror. Maybe we should let Juliet and Peter argue this one out because they, <laughs> they are not arguing the same proposition here. I mean, this is entirely different. Juliet says the war on terror, as, we, as she's defining, is already over. And Peter says it's time to end it now because we've decimated most of the al-Qaeda leadership and the ideology right. was defeated in, in the Arab Spring. These are, these are totally different propositions. And so we're not clear. Well, there are two factual job. arguments that make the case. <laughs> Peter Berger. Right. <laughs> Which is fair, which is a fair way to do it, but I, I, I think we hear your point. Michael Hayden. I return to, to my point that I'm the one on stage who got the phone call in the middle of the night. I knew what the war was about. Right? It was about what he said. It was about the authorization for the use of military force and the ability to use combat power against al-Qaeda and affiliated organizations. There was no confusion on my part. And so I, I, I don't quite understand if that's still okay, <laughs> what is it we're departing from? Um, well, a, a sort of another way to look at this, by the way, is that President Clinton tried to kill bin Laden in 1998 with cruise missile strikes. I mean, this is not new, the idea that we uh, reserve to ourselves the, 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 the ability to kill enemies of the state. Uh, what we're just calling for an end of this all-encompassing global conflict that has cost us so much money. We're not, we're not call, calling for a global police action against terrorists, certainly. Uh, we, we reserve the right for a certain kind of warlike activities, uh, but it's time to stop this sort of grandiose uh, approach where we're at war with any, any person who, who's ever said the word jihad around the world, which is gonna get us, which is gonna cost us a lot of money. Peter, uh, that's and a cartoon. It's, that's a straw that's a cartoon. man, Peter. That's, no one says that anymore. It's just not the case. I mean, you, you, can, you can lambaste the other side of this debate at, by constructing the straw man, but that's just not it. I mean, we're not well, arguing is it, that. Is it, Peter? I mean, do, do you feel that that's still the rhetoric coming from the U.S.? Well, I think when we say the war on terror, I mean, you know, when, when FDR went to war <coughs> against the, the Nazis, he didn't, you know, declare war against it, the tactic of, of U-boats um, and, and kamikaze pilots in the case of Japan. I mean... The, the, the war on terror was a very uh, expansive notion uh, that pulled us into the conflicts in Iraq that we know of and, and others. And that's what we're, we're, we're saying, not only is it the end, for, uh, the end of that, I mean, uh, Juliet is making the point that it's in a sense already ended, but also our enemies are essentially defeated. Um, and defeat doesn't mean, you know, total obliteration. It means that we can now move on and say, um, essentially that the longest war in American history, which is, it is now the longest war in American history, you know, there's a time, to, a time to move on. All right, I'd like to go to some questions from the audience. Um, 
And, uh, and the way we'll do this, I can now see you, and we'll ha I think I explained beforehand, I believe everybody was here. If you raise your hand, um, a microphone will be brought to you. We'd ask you to rise, to be terse, to make it a question, to keep it on point, um, and to keep the microphone about four inches away from your, from your mouth. And um, there's a gentleman in the very center. If you, I'm looking right at you, and if you stand up, they'll bring a mic over to you. Uh, I, I just want to get the mic over to you so that we can uh, hear you on the radio broadcast. My question is to Peter and Juliet. I think the other side has defined very well what they think would be lost if the war on terror, as they define it, would be ended. Can you explain very clearly what would be gained if the war on terror, as you define it, would be ended? Thank you. Uh, could you say that last part again? If the war what would be gained by ending the war on terror, as you define it? Honesty, descriptiveness, uh, actually reflecting what's happening out there. I mean, whether the war on terror ended as we started to change just a learning process over 10 years to effective counterterrorism, um, uh, effective counterterrorism tools. That happened over the course of a 10 year period. So the reason why not to call it on a war on terror is because I don't, I mean, because we know what the war on terror meant. Now, they can now claim it was just a legal device. But I, I lived that time. We all lived that time. We all served in government. Three of us served in government during that time. So I've just you know, sort of asked people to remember, as, as we have been discussing, what that meant. It's not an indictment on everything that happened or the changes or whatever else. It is just simply, today, we have effective counterterrorism measures. Some of them. Might be, might be military, might be the use of military force as authorized by law. Many of them will not be. And it's as simple as that. And, and so, you know, we can say that we didn't mean by the war on terror anything but there's this law. And that's just for you all to decide if can, that's what you thought it meant can, at that time. Can I ask you, sir, to, first of all, um, if you don't mind identifying yourself. <laughs> um, and then in terms of the answer, do you feel that your answer was, the, your question was answered, that it was addressed? Uh, my name's Philip Gurevich, I'm a writer. I was asking uh, whether you think, the, the issues that you're describing are a, are a kind of broad conception of the war on terror, and they're defining it as a legal set of tool, a toolbox. And you're essentially saying that you agree with them that that legal toolbox should not be abandoned. So I'm saying, what could, would could you, you I'm sorry, one more time, could you stand? You don't have to repeat the question because you were about to repeat it anyway. Okay. But go you, ahead. You're saying that that tool, are you saying, you're saying that toolbox shouldn't be abandoned either, but the right. concept of the war on terror should because of a bunch of things that you say have essentially been changed. not been practiced for a while. So right. it seems like you think it should be redefined. Right, exactly. And, but, and I'm and asking there's what a would be gained by saying the war on terror is over uh, and wouldn't, if you're still preserving all those legal tools right. that you think that they, sh that they say that we them, should. Yeah. yeah, no, that I think, uh, and and answering in terms, I think, more descriptive of actually what we're doing, uh, more limited uh, uh, sort of description of what counterterrorism efforts and procedures actually are. Uh, there's a difference between counterterrorism uh, efforts and actions and war. And I, th I think of, the question might, also, might that also be reframed as what's the harm to con in continuing to call it a war on terror? Well, then that's my, that's my I, I viewed the war on terror as so expansive and defining so many authorities, including a commander-in-chief uh, by all means, you know, any means necessary to protect us, that explains a 10-year or eight-year trajectory. I'm not going back to say, oh, look how horrible they are. I'm going back to say, that's what the war on terror was. Aren't we glad that we have moved away from that? Okay. They moved away Let, from it, we moved away I just want to see if your opponents would like to respond. Yeah, I'll, uh, Michael I'll, I'll talk about one dimension of the expansiveness. You know, war on terror, wh whatever the rhetoric was, it was war on Al-Qaeda and its affiliates. I'm sorry to repeat myself. I did not have the authority to do against Hezbollah and other terrorist organizations who were unaffiliated with Al-Qaeda and not responsible for the attack on 9-11, the authorities I had to deal with this well, clearly defined enemy. So the expansiveness in that dimension wasn't expansive. In addition, the expansiveness in this direction, what is it you could do against this enemy force, was controlled by U.S. law, by the Constitution. But was not the invasion of Iraq, which had its own authorization, also part of the war on terror, as they're describing it? I 
you know, we can talk a lot about different and specific things. But no, no, but no, no, but, no, but Mike, it, 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 but, I, I'm, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm not debating the merits of the war in Iraq yeah. at all, or asking you to, or yeah. I'm not debating with you because I'm the moderator. I'm just trying to, to, I'm just trying to, I'm trying to deliver what I heard as her point to you, which is that there is an expansiveness to, that, that the term leads to an expansiveness of actions. Did, did, okay, so did the attack on 9-11 create an environment in which the, it was more likely that our government will make a decision to go to war with Iraq? I think that's clear. Okay, the war in Iraq was not tied to the authorization for the use of military force. And people like me in the American intelligence community made it very clear that there were not operational connections between the Iraqi intelligence service and Al Qaeda, the named enemy, mm -hmm. in the AUMF. Yeah, yeah, John, I mean, as, as a, to your direct <laughs> question, you the answer is, is D President Bush and his principal officers and explaining the rationale for going to war against Iraq did reference the war on terror extensively and repeatedly. And they were by no means unique in doing so. That occurred on both sides of the political aisle and may still go on today. Now, whether that was an appropriate characterization or not, who knows? But, I mean, they did. Well, I think we do know. <laughs> <laughs> but right. Is this a debate about ending the war in Iraq or ending the war on terror? Well, they were related to each other. I mean, that was the way the way the war was sold was that it was part of the war on terror. That was the intellectual architecture of the war. But again, Peter, that, those are events of a half a decade ago or longer. Well, we're still in Iraq. Well, well yeah, we are. With, and frankly, I mean, we, we all have to deal with life as it is, not as we wish it would have been. And so when I oh, oh come, there are people who are actually responsible for things have to deal with the world as it is, not as they wish it to be. And that may be the actual core of the debate. All right, I'd like to go to another question. You know, I'm, I'm, can, can I just people often ask me, why don't you call on more women? Because women aren't raising their hands. So <laughs> I'd like to get, oh, there you are. You mind Thank giving you. us your name too? Thank Thanks. you, yes, my name is Eileen Carlbach. And um, I think it relates to the first gentleman's question. I don't understand the economic benefits of ending the war on terrorism. You talked about the trillions of dollars that we're mm -hmm. spending, and I am tired of this recession. How will ending the war on terrorism give money back? Well, I mean, it's a factual matter that we spent a trillion dollars at least in Iraq, right? I mean, we're, we're by winding down there and uh, no longer part of the war on terror there. Uh, we're going to save ourselves a lot of money. As a factual matter, we spent half a trillion dollars on our intelligence. Uh, I think Juliet would have a better answer on how much we spent on our homeland security. We spent a huge amount of money on this, and we can't afford it right now. And clearly, uh, there is some belt tightening that is needed. And if we stopped having this fearful construct of the war on terror, it would help making the hard decisions that we need to make about reducing the size of our bloated. I mean, I mentioned the fact that there are a million Americans with top secret clearances. That, that's not secret, top secret. It's, I don't think that all of those people really need these top secret clearances. We're facing a group of people that on a good day may now number about 300 or 400. But it was a recession question on that one. I, I'm not sure how this, the clearance issue would relate to that. Well, I mean, we are going to have to reduce the number of people in our intelligence apparatus. Mm -hmm. I mean, that we, we're going to have to reduce the number of people we are going to draw down in Afghanistan and in Iraq. Uh, and by saying that the war on terror is over, that is, you know, that's going to help uh, those decisions. We, we asked, um, uh, or Slate, Slate asked its readers uh, and subscribers to submit questions to us, and the, Slate selected a few for us, and I'd like to, to bring one of them up, because I think it goes to this side, and to some degree, Richard, you addressed this, you touched on this, but it's more specific. His name is Peter McKay, he's actually from uh, New York City. Since you believe it is not yet time to end the war on terror, could you please explain what specific conditions you would have to see met to know that that time has come? No. <laughs> All right, fair question. Michael Hayden? Yeah, um, I'm kind of with Rich. This will be something that um, we'll recognize when we see it, like the Supreme Court Justice described something else. All I, all I can do is repeat what I said earlier. Everybody I know who is actually responsible for getting us to the state we are in now, which is far better than we were one, five, or 10 years ago, no one thinks it's time to stop. No one thinks that we have gotten to a point where Al Qaeda is is sufficiently non-resilient that it cannot regenerate. Right. And, and, and until we reach that point and make that judgment, 
No, I don't, I don't think we should end what Rich and I are arguing we should continue, which is a legal authority to use all the tools at the disposal of the American government. Richard, why is it difficult to foresee what those conditions would be? Well, uh, it's just something that I wouldn't want to write down on paper or articulate until you have to. And so I'm quite comfortable with the proposition tonight that now is not the time to do it. Um, do I want to rule out that some future time, if we have a new government in Pakistan, fundamentally changed environment in the Horn of Africa and the Arabian Peninsula, might that be the conditions then? Maybe. But there's nothing pushing it. There's no, as a, one of the first questions that came from the audience, sort of what's the harm? I'm not seeing any harm. Uh, any benefits that were gained by ending the war on terror, as particularly as Juliet defines it, were already gained when President Obama got elected and won the Nobel Prize, principally for not being Bush. And, and, you know, this is the, the benefits have already accrued. Only harm comes from changing the legal apparatus that allows us to continue offensive military operations. I just don't Juliet know Payne. how, I mean, first of all, with all due respect, General Hayden, I think no one is arguing that Al Qaeda, no one in authority or who has to deal with dealing with the security apparatus or figuring out how to use um, how, you know, how to distribute funds that are drying up, because that's what, you know, in particular Homeland Security, that's what state and locals are dealing with. That's what police departments are dealing with. How do I prioritize the threat out there when everyone wants to be safe, not just from terrorism, but from crime and whatever else may go on? So, so no one is arguing that uh, we're closing the door to acknowledgement of a threat of terror. And it's just not the debate. And so, Th that is, so they're sort of throwing up a, a bunch of straw men against the sort of this typical notion of people who want the American public to acknowledge, and maybe it happened two years ago with the election of Obama. I actually think it actually started to happen towards the end of the Bush administration, this growing recognition, right, that war and what war meant was not the way to describe what we were doing. And General Hayden talks about this consensus that we sort of, everyone sort of doing, we want all the tools in the toolbox. But I mean, to remind people, the, the consensus was not a consensus because the president decided it was a consensus. It took Congress, the courts, the public, leaders within the Bush administration, and yes, a new president, to realize that this construct that we had created over the course of six, eight, or 10 years needed to be thought about in a different way. And that's what we're asking of you. I'm not saying, you know, throw in the towel, let bin Laden, you know, hang out with his wives. That is not what we're saying. And, you, and it's a disservice to, this, to, to people that, who want to challenge this notion of the war on terror okay. to caricature I, us I that way. I want to go back to another question, sir. Um, I'm looking at you, and you can, if you stand up, because you see me looking at you, just, to, just wait for the mic, and if you can tell us who you are. Yeah, I'm Matt Foley. Uh, I was just wondering, in 1993, the, the Trade Center was bombed first time, and they went a different route. They didn't start a war on terror. They prosecuted the people responsible. Could you guys just give me an idea of what the cost of this war on terror has been? Dollars, we know that there's been thousands of lives, but in comparison to what was done in 93, why, why is this approach better than that one? Because it seems to me that, that they were able to apprehend the people responsible much more quickly and with far less. So uh, your question is to the side against the motion. Yes. No, uh, to start. Mike yeah. Hayden. Um, in, in its starkest form, uh, the law enforcement approach uh, after the first attack on the World Trade Center in 93 did not prevent the destruction of the World Trade Centers in 2001. The we are a nation at war approach following 2001 has prevented any similar attack on the United States in the ensuing 10 years. I think that's the biggest distinction. Let me just say that. Three I, years? Three years? I'm so from, 90, from 93 to 2000, there was no attacks. Right. So what you're saying is that this war, because we, we don't know when the next, if hopefully it won't, there won't be any more attacks. Well, right actually, now, there actually the were. They weren't against the continental United States, but they it's were against U.S. Happened. interests abroad. And, and if I could just say, I tell you, one of the rhetorical excesses of the first Bush administration, uh, so, so, you know, 2001 to 2004, in which I served, which troubled me, was a, uh, he, they did tend to dismiss the law enforcement approach as they were talking about the various military options. There's no question that there was a somewhat disdainful view of the law enforcement. As someone who then left the White House and went and worked in law enforcement, uh, no longer do, I, that troubled me because it strikes me as it's a completely legitimate set of options available to the executive branch and d deserves, no, it should not be dis treated disdainfully at all. There were successful prosecutions in that time 
period. Ramsey Youssef is currently serving a life sentence in Supermax. He was one of the architects of it, the nephew of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, uh, one of the architects of 9-11. But there were many other aspects of that investigation that were enormously problematic, principally concerning the compartmentalization of information and the inability to allow the information generated in the law enforcement investigation to sort of transmute across the interagency and inform a wider intelligence perspective of a growing threat. Now, Juliet, a few people uh, saw it, but the system as a whole struggled to grasp it. Juliet Kayyem. I, I, I would actually totally agree with Rich on this point. I think that the changes that were made um, uh, over the course of the 10 years, not because we had to call it a war, but these were actually statutory changes made to the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, um, have been, have done a tremendous, uh, have brought about tremendous changes within both the law enforcement intelligence community, local law enforcement, and whatever else. So I'm, I'm actually would agree with, I think we're all sort of, there's a variety of tools that can be used by any present executive branch uh, member or whatever else to, to counter um, Al-Qaeda and to but defeat Al-Qaeda. Sir, I, I'm going to move on just because I, I think they actually both have answered your question. You might not like the answer, but they've mm -hmm. addressed it. Um, right, yep. <clears throat> if you can stand, sir. Uh, Warren Ilchman. Um, I've heard uh, uh, Al-Qaeda and its affiliates, and I've heard Hezbollah mention, but no one has mentioned in the whole evening the Taliban. Must the Taliban be defeated before the war on uh, terror is completed? Which side would you like to put that question to first? <laughs> okay, let's put it to Peter Bergen. Yes. <laughs> so the Taliban has to be made irrelevant and the Taliban, uh, to a large degree, is becoming less relevant in Afghanistan over time. And that's, you know, I think what we're looking at, if we pull out for a little bit, what are we actually, there are still Marxist-Leninists somewhere in the United States on some college campus somewhere. Just no one pays any attention to them. And, you know, we're at the point where Al-Qaeda and its ideas, and, and we include in that the Taliban, but which, by the way, enjoys only a 7% favorable rating in Afghanistan right now. There's nothing like living under the Taliban as a prophylactic to... Uh, uh, the, the, their ideas about creating a utopia here on earth uh, uh, don't make sense. So, you know, we, these, these ideas are becoming irrelevant, and that's why the war on terror should, should be ended. I mean, we've just heard from Rich that he won't even tell us when the war will end. Well, if it, if it doesn't end with the founder and leader of al-Qaeda, the intellectual author of 9-11, which is the reason we went to war in Afghanistan in the first place, the fact the Taliban wouldn't hand him over. If it, if it doesn't end when it's totally irrelevant in the Middle East, if it doesn't end when it's lost the war of ideas in the Muslim world, if it doesn't end when its entire top leadership is decimated, I mean, when does it end? Richard Falkenroth, is the Taliban irrelevant? No, it's not. I mean, it's not irrelevant. It certainly matters a lot in the reconstruction of Afghanistan and the, in the geopolitics of that region. Uh, there's no question that they supported 9-11, the Taliban organization. They supported al-Qaeda prior to 9-11. Now it looks like that was a very expensive thing for them to do, and there are other groups in this area. Peter is actually far more expert on this than I am, that are still supporting the remnants of al-Qaeda Central, such as it were. So that's a long-winded way of saying they are not essential to some sort of winning the war on terror prevailing them, but there's no question that because of their historical legacy, they are legitimate targets for the U.S. military in what we call are calling here the war on terror as it operates in Afghanistan and Pakistan. But to blend both, both Peter and Richard's point, um, the destruction of them may not be required in the same way that you want to destroy Al-Qaeda core. Peter's comment about destroying their relevance, I think, is, is the actual objective there. Um, Ma'am, uh, yeah, if you can rise, the mic will come to you. Hi, often a war is constituted with about troop levels, so I would like to know each side's perspective on troop levels in ending the war or continuing the war. Troop levels, where? I'm not sure, wait, can you be, try another crack at that? Do you believe that troops should be brought out of Afghanistan to where the war is being conducted? Or should we continue to have troops? And for how long? Okay. Uh, as I, thank you. Uh, my last appearance at this debate right. forum was arguing that the war in Afghanistan was Peter something we should continue. Max Boot was also here in the audience. I think it would be difficult for me to now change my mind uh, <laughs> and uh, in such a public uh, fashion. 
And I think that we, you know, we, there are things that we, you know, making sure that Afghanistan doesn't revert into a haven for the Taliban and allied groups is, uh, you know, that is a, a very good thing. Um, you know, it was the war on terror kind of construct that got us into a war which cost us a lot more in blood and treasure where, where we were not attacked from, which of course was Iraq. Michael Hayden. I agree very strongly with what Peter said, and I, I would suggest to you that the size of the American footprint there over time matters. I mean, it, it, it does have an effect, but far more important is the persistence of the American footprint. We, we left that region before, and we suffered for it greatly on 9-11. On and so uh, I think Peter and I are in strong agreement that some substantial American presence there, as difficult as that is for us for a variety of reasons, keeps us so much safer that it's probably worth those sacrifices. But is that presence of, is that, does that constitute war, Peter? Well, I mean, we, as Juliet has said, and I, I've said, I mean, we're not opposed to conducting, continuing um, our presence in Afghanistan and uh, making sure that it doesn't revert into a but, safe but, haven. But we're talking about what we call it. So would you call it? Well, you call I, you know, war, it's a war against al-Qaeda and its allies. The president, President Obama, correctly redefined downwards uh, this open-ended global conflict against a tactic in, and named the enemy. Um, and that's the enemy that we continue to fight. Okay. Um, right in the center. The people on this side uh, define ending the war on terror as repealing the legal instrument that authorized military force. I don't understand on this side exactly what it is that you do, what you define the ending of the end of the war on terror. Is it declaring victory and going home? Because President Bush did that on the aircraft carrier. Mm -hmm. uh, How'd that go? Didn't go so well. I just don't understand exactly what it is that you think it should President uh, Obama give no, a speech we're not, and declare we're not, victory? Well, Julia so Crane. here's what's so interesting about this. This was we're not. Thank you. We're not um, asking for a, this war is over. I mean, if anything, I I hope that. The description of the last year showed that this is this may be a bit too late not to you know criticize Intelligence Squared, that I actually think without you knowing it, we did end the war on terror and that when trying to expose how we ended it, it's and what the reason for discussing it in such an open manner is because how we talk about counterterrorism measures whether it's killing bin Laden or it's bringing someone to an Article III court or it's working with Arab and Muslim communities so that they, they, will, they will feel comfortable with the NYPD and tell them when there might be extremists among their, amongst their myths, certainly something the NYPD has been great at. What we're, what, so, so that is sort of uh, an acknowledgement of the reality of where we are because it, it, it affects how we perceive ourselves. It clearly affects how the rest, everyone else, uh, perceives us in the outside world and you know and it's not the war on terror is not a benign statement I mean we've been sitting here hearing like you know oh yes we may have gone too far and maybe this war and uh, you know it, it wasn't benign and so maybe part of our obligation 10 years later is to admit it's not a benign term Richard Falcon the, the uh, I think the question uh, underscores one of the difficulties in, in Juliet and Peter's position on here. And if I could just sharpen it and pose it also as a question, since we've agreed, or at least I think that Juliet concedes, we shouldn't change the legal framework that currently governs counterterrorism operations by U.S. forces abroad. You could talk about it rhetorically differently. And in fact, President Obama could have his aircraft carrier moment right now, wherever he wanted, to go out and announce that he is announcing the end of the war on terror. Okay, now, question, we, you used to work for him in a cabinet department, could go back and work for him. Would you recommend he do that? Absolutely. Why, wouldn't, why would I not recommend that? I'm asking, you would? What? He would never do it, first of and all. Because no, the be politics, <laughs> let me tell you why he wouldn't. <clears throat> because it took me nine months to move 19 Massachusetts National Guard members uh, from, a, from a pilgrim facility. Because the war on terror is not benign, because this notion of the war on terror, it has uh, completely limited our politicians' capacity to move. And I think the amazing thing about this president is how much he has moved us. But this gets to the right? question so, that came up so earlier. If so I, if I, I think it would be bad political advice and he should fire me if I told, in the same way, you know, if I told him to say the war on terror is over. Not because I think it's inaccurate, but because I actually think 
that, that politically, we, this, the public, and the way we've talked about it give no opportunity uh, for the kinds of changes, the little changes I had to make or the, the big changes that have been made. All right, let Richard come in on this. Oh, I think this circles back to an earlier question, which is what would be, be what gain would come from accepting your side of this argument? And what would happen is President Obama and his advisors would say, look, I've already realized all the gains. Right. I talk about it differently. I won the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, I don't need to do this. It's already done, you know. Right. So you agree that it's over? No. No. I mean, isn't that no. what you're no. saying? You are admitting, and you're also admitting that it would be political suicide for anyone to say it. And all I'm saying is, maybe we can create a space where it, that's not true, where we can move 19 Massachusetts National Guard members, or we can create more stringent military commissions, or we can close the black sites, or whatever it is that we need to do. And that's actually a good thing, because it means we've changed over 10 years. Sir. Yeah, uh, my name's Josh Zepps. I'm from Sydney, Australia. Um, just in, in an attempt to sort of bridge this definitional gap about the war on terror, um, a question to Richard. Um, don't you feel that over the long arc of history that maybe the greatest sort of inhibition on people's freedom is governments and not so much um, terrorism and, and outside threats? And do you fear that maybe an open-ended war that goes forever, that you're not even able to say when that could possibly end, is more of a liability, even if it gives us more of a tool, more tools in the arsenal in the short term, that maybe the long-term liability outweighs that? How, how do you feel yeah, about, about question, being Richard. party to that? It's, 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 it's a great question. In fact, it's several questions uh, marbled together. Uh, and one is there's no question over the arc of history that governments have done more harm to human beings than any terrorist organization has. The governments are capable of enormous uh, destructive <laughs> destruction against those people. There's no question about that. And I don't think Al-Qaeda or any terrorist group is 10 feet tall. I don't go to sleep afraid. Uh, I never did. And they are a, what I think a, ultimately a manageable problem. In this, there. There is always the potential for government excess. Government in our country domestically has a monopoly on the use of force and is authorized in certain circumstances to invade your liberty and your privacy in all sorts of ways. And one of the great debates in, in this country and in any country is how do you set those rules? You know, what are they? And it's not set in stone. It evolves and changes over time. In fact, the last 10 years since 9-11 have illustrated that, and it has evolved greatly. And I think Juliet pointed this out, that there have been evolution in every single functional area. It has evolved. But here I want to come back to what my colleague Mike said. There really is today a consensus on this. There really is. It's remarkable. On electronic surveillance, there is a consensus. There was not. In, 19, in 2005, when James Risen published the details of a certain classified program, today there is. FISA Modernization Act was passed, broad bipartisan support. Obama is all for it. Bush was for it. No problem. On detention, right, there is actually consensus on what happens now from where it was with Bush to today. On tribunals, also consensus. President Obama has expressly endorsed the, tri the military tribunal process signed into law by President Bush enacted by the previous Congress. So long-winded way of saying, to your question, yes, there are risks there. We must constantly be vigilant for them. But there is broad consensus right now on where those lines should be drawn across the political elite in Washington. This narrative of consensus was Julia not a Kaya. consensus ne necessarily of choice. Right. I mean, let's not forget, you know, it's not like all these like really, you know, smart people sat in a room and go, OK, well, maybe we were excessive then. But now this got, you know, now we're going to be all kumbaya and figure out how to do this right. It was a consensus because the Bush administration lost a lot in court because Congress uh, required them to make changes. And and that lasted into the o Obama administration because their own national security experts, including interrogators, uh, um, uh, people in the military justice system, lawyers in the Department of Justice who didn't like the secret surveillance were rebelling, right? This was not, so, so I'm glad that there's a consensus, but it's just, I, I challenge this notion that, and, ask, and you, ask you to remember that this sort of came about because in all actuality, you know, sort of every smart person thinks the same. Michael this was Hayden. very, very difficult decisions. Michael Hayden. Yeah. Uh, very great questions to raise. And, and let me give you just a, maybe a different perspective to, to look at it and states and what they do to their citizens. Um, if we have certain authorities, all right, that the states are exercising. 
but for reasons of discomfort or political risk or, or, or what else, a government decides not to exercise the full extent of their authorities. And because of doing that, uh, very bad things happen to their citizens. That because they did not do all that they could do, that they did not do all that the law allowed, that for political reasons they played back from the line. And I used to describe this to our workforce as to why we had to be as aggressive as we possibly could be within the law. Because my view is this little box I'm creating for you is the field in which we're allowed to play. If we play back from those lines and we fail and bad things happen to you of a catastrophic nature that ha like happened 10 years ago, that box I drew here, you're going to draw a different box. You are. And the box is going to be this way. So in, in another way, the way we in security professionals, the intelligence community view this is we have to be very aggressive within the law doing our job because if we fail, the natural tendency of a country like ours or a country like Australia would be to do things probably destructive to their long-term liberties out of fear. And that concludes round two of this Intelligence Squared U.S. debate. So here's where we are. We are about to hear brief closing statements from each debater in turn. They will be two minutes each. And remember, uh, you members of the audience, you voted before the debate. We're going to ask you to vote once again afterwards. This is their last chance to change your mind. Um, I'd also, with your indulgence, like to just record one more um, item for the radio broadcast um, where to allow them to take a break in the middle of uh, the section that just happened. And it would be wonderful if I could ask you to applaud. I'll say my line, and then we can move forward, OK? So if you could just applaud, that would be terrific. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome back to this Intelligence Squared US debate. We're in the question and answer section. I'm John Donvan, your moderator. We have four debaters, two teams of two debating this motion. It is time to end the war on terror. That's it. Thank you. All right. So now on to round three. These are closing statements. They will be two minutes each, each debater speaking in turn. And our motion is, it is time to end the war on terror. And speaking first against the motion, Michael Hayden, former director of the National Security Agency and the CIA. Thanks, John. Um, our rich and, richest purpose in mind here tonight was not to defend all aspects of what our government has done over the last 10 years. Uh, there have been a lot of thoughts put out about some things that some people find uh, offensive or uncomfortable about what we've done. I actually think a lot of those points are debatable, but that's not tonight's debate. Uh, what we're looking at is, broadly speaking, how should we conceive ourselves in order to ensure our own national security? And, and I mean no disrespect, but I'm trying to follow in detail what it is we're arguing against from the other side. And I think it's not an unfair characterization. Continue what we're doing, but we have a desperate plea to repackage the atmospherics around which that which we are doing. And I'm trying to parse out the arguments for desperately repackaging. And from Peter, I think I'm getting the argument that you've been successful. Back off. You've won the thing. And from Juliet, I'm getting the argument, you shouldn't have been doing all those things that you were doing that Peter said were successful because it enabled you to win those things. This is an important matter. That 1% of the republic that's defending the other 99% needs to know you're with them and that you're behind them. And I mentioned in my earlier comments about uh, not being too celebratory. And Peter's right, massive events in the last six months the Arab Spring, and the killing of bin Laden. If one were to write a history of the American Civil War, one could determine, I think looking backward, that the decisive events took place in the first three days of July in 1863 with the fall of Vicksburg and the defeat of Pickett's Charge going up Cemetery Hill. I think historians would agree it was decisive. But there was 21 months of war left after that. And spiking the football and calling it a win and walking away from the battlefield in July of 1863 would have put at risk all that we now know have been achieved by that point. Thank you, Mike Layden. Our motion is, it is time to end the war on terror. And to speak for the motion, Peter Bergen, a CNN national security analyst and director of national security studies at the New America Foundation. 
We've heard from Rich tonight that Al-Qaeda isn't 10 feet tall and also it's a manageable problem, but also that we should be uh, at war against this uh, terrorism tactic until the 22nd century, uh, that there's no circumstances that he can define tonight when we should declare the, the end of this war. And as we were thinking about this question, we turned to two of the leading experts uh, on terrorism in the world uh, for some counsel. One of them said, we here in the United States certainly are much safer. Al-Qaeda still exists, but it's been massively damaged through nine years of an onslaught against them. Our defensive abilities here in the country, our intelligence, our law enforcement, our, our homeland security is much better. So there's no, there's no question the United States is safer. The second leading expert said just a few weeks, weeks ago, future attacks are gonna be more numerous, but less complex. Less well organized, less well likely to succeed, and less lethal if they do succeed. I think the killing of bin Laden will accelerate that change. The first expert was Richard Falkenrath speaking to CNN almost exactly a year ago, and the second expert was General Hayden speaking to the Associated Press <laughs> this summer after the death of bin Laden. We agree with both these gentlemen that Al-Qaeda has been massively damaged, and that there's no question that we're safer, and that this much weakened Al-Qaeda is far less likely to succeed with any of even of the small bore attacks it will try and pull off in the future, and that this process of Al-Qaeda decline has been accelerated with the death of their leader. And for these reasons, and because we agree with these gentlemen and others we've outlined this evening, we urge you for the vote, to vote for the motion that it's time to end the war on terror. Thank you, Peter Bergen. Our motion is it is time to end the war on terror. And here to speak against the motion, Richard Falkenrath, who is former Deputy Commissioner for Counterterrorism at the NYPD and Deputy Homeland Security Advisor. Thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure tonight uh, to argue this out. It is a very important issue. Juliet and I have many things in common. We both were at Harvard for a while. We have uh, children of about the same age. We also had the privilege of serving at both the federal level of government, in my case the local, her the state level. Uh, and that perspective for me was immensely valuable to come to New York. I was not a New Yorker, but I came here to work at the NYPD uh, for four years. Gave me a different perspective on these issues and one that I think is illustrative. The easiest thing to do for us in this debate, tactically, is just sort of to decry the rhetorical excesses that, frankly, Juliet has de decried of the first few years after the Bush administration. It was a very divisive time in our political life, a uh, very troubling time, frankly. But I, I was struck today, actually, walk into this debate, I saw something that made me say, I shouldn't just dismiss it all completely, which was there was a fire truck going by, and it was making a big loud siren, uh, and it was barreling to some emergency. And on the front, they had stenciled support our troops, which said to me that the local responders, these local officials who, who are not in the military and have no extra authority gained from any of these laws that have been passed, in fact, see a certain common purpose with the military officers and the intelligence officers who are still at war in a technical, though somewhat invisible, a sense. And that's, I think, a useful way to remember this. It, it isn't the, the, the sense of unity that this country achieved post 9-11 about dealing with this problem also was a little bit ahistoric, which is my way of saying, yes, there were many bad things that happened at that time, things that I criticize, and as Peter notes, I've written about it and talked about it in papers and stuff like that. But there were also some good elements of it. And if, if there was no better way rhetorically to unify the various actions of many different parts of America, the military and the intelligence, lawyers, the first responders, the rest, uh, then war on terror, that's what they came up with and it worked all right. So on that basis, in addition to the, compli the, the sort of legal arguments we've, ex we've urged you to accept, I urge you to vote against this motion. Thank you, Richard Falkenrath. Our motion is it is time. Our motion is it is time to end the war on terror and here to speak for the motion, Juliet Kayem, the National Security and Foreign Policy columnist for the Boston Globe and former Assistant Secretary at the Department of Homeland Security. So, uh, General Hayden and Rich Falkenrath, I want to thank you both and thank you both um, for your service uh, and this audience as well. Um, they would have you believe that we simply want to repackage something, and they would have you believe that we would want to throw away laws that would have given Obama the authority to kill bin Laden. And they want you to believe that there's this sort of continuity of behavior over the course of the 10 years. And none of that is true. And that, I, I actually think none of it is true. Because one, we're not saying throw away the laws, throw away the uh, authorization for the use of military force. Nor is the war on terror a benign statement, right? It is, it is neither descriptive anymore, nor is it benign. And the continuity has actually been, I think, one of the sort of 
I think what's happened over the last 10 years has been sort of remarkable because it was not continuous. That what you saw over time was the American public, Congress, the courts, the Supreme Court several times, the Bush administration itself with its own internal conflicts and a change in leadership between the presidents show that it wasn't continuous, right? It's not just the ex excesses that I, I said, it was actually what, got, what made us better what made our counterterrorism measures better? And they got better over time, right? So that all sorts of things are not happening because of this learning curve. So now we're supposed to wake up 10 years later and say, okay, well, that was, it was good, we called it that, and let's just continue to call, that, call it that because that was, it's benign, or you know, it, it's just a legal matter. And all, all we're asking you to do is actually think about that a little bit differently. Remember the 10 years, be grateful for the work of both administrations, but also realize the war on terror as a unifying force is no longer accurate or benign. Thank you. Thank you, Julia Tam. And that concludes our closing statements, and now it's time to learn which side you feel has argued best. We're gonna ask you again to go to the keypads at your seats. Our motion is, it is time to end the war on terror. If you agree with the motion, push number one. If you disagree, push number two. And if you remain or became undecided, push number three. And uh, we're about two minutes away from having that number tabulated and compared to the opening votes, and we'll be able to declare our winner. So before we g get to that, I have a few things I want to take care of, beginning with wanting to thank uh, this panel for the quality of the discussion that they brought here, the respect that they showed each other. Uh, their expertise was on display as well as, as their respect for the power of a good argument. Um, also, um, is your daughter shy about taking bows in audiences? She's not. So your children are, I'm assuming, up in Boston, but one of Richard's, two of your kids are here. So why don't you, because you're pretty young for a policy debate. So why don't you stand up and... and Thank you. They looked at you with admiring eyes throughout the debate. I also want to take note of the fact that our audience includes a contingent from West Point. We want to thank you guys and women for coming down here. And um, we had a number of people watching live stream on Slate. We want to thank them for, uh, for, for participating and watching and sending in the questions. And also, uh, for you as an audience, you were a terrific audience, and we did hear you. And I appreciated all of your applause, both spontaneous and rehearsed and requested by me. <laughs> Thanks a lot for that. So we're all going to be back here on Tuesday, September 20th. Our motion on the 20th of September is, men are finished. <laughs> Arguing for this motion, we have Dan Abrams, my colleague at ABC News. He's our chief legal analyst and author of the book, Man Down, Proof Beyond a Reasonable Doubt that Women Are Better Cops, Drivers, Gamblers, Spies, World Leaders, Beer Tasters, Hedge Fund Managers, and just about everything else. <laughs> Joining him is Hannah Rosen, a writer for The Atlantic and Slate, and it was her controversial article, The End of Men, that inspired this debate. Arguing against the motion, Christina Hoff Summers, who is best known for her extensive writings, among them The War Against Boys and Who Stole Feminism, which chronicles feminism's divisive turn. And finally, David Sinchenko, who is editor-in-chief of Men's Health magazine and author of the best-selling Eat This, Not That series, and a longtime friend of his opponent in that debate Dan Abrams, and according to the New York Observer, this debate has, quote, already divided two halves of a media bromance. <laughs> so you'll find a full listing of uh, this fall's debates in tonight's program that you can pick up on your way in or out, and on our website where tickets are available for purchase. And all of our debates um, can be heard on NPR stations across the country, including WNYC here in New York, and also viewable on WNET's 13, WLIW, and NJTV. Don't forget to follow Intelligence Squared on Twitter, and make sure to become a fan of us on Facebook, and if you do so, you'll get a discount to future debates. Okay, so we've had you vote twice, and the results have been tabulated, and here it is. Our motion is, it is time to end the war on terror, and recall, the side that has changed the most minds, moved its numbers the most in the course of this debate, is declared our winner. Here are the results. Before the debate, 41% of you were for the motion, 
28% against, and 31% undecided. After the debate, 46% are for the motion. That is up 5%. 43% are against. That is up 15%. And undecided went down by 20% to 11%. That means the side against the motion has carried this debate. Our congratulations to them. And thank you for me, John Donvan from Intelligence Squared U.S. We'll see you next time.